Welcome to the third episode of Avian's official systems engineering podcast. This episode, we're talking about what it takes to be a modeler. And I understand, as Rhett has informed me, modeler is a little bit of a controversial term. Um, so let's, before I'm ready to jump into questions, let's introduce everybody. Today, I have Casey, Rhett, Jeff, and Lindsay on the line with me. Um, we're here to talk about exactly what a modeler is and what it takes to get to... Uh, being a modeler. So Rhett, the first question for you, um, what, what's the right term for modeler? And we, we talked about this a little bit already, but for the recording, can you explain um, maybe why modeler is not a great term for it and then what the correct term would be? So there's a lot of back and forth on that. I'd say uh, modeler, model-based systems engineer, systems engineer, uh, architect, kind of a lot of people use a lot of different terms. There's a bit of a negative connotation, I think, with modeler as kind of being equivalent to CAD jockey. Most of the people in a system engineering or model-based system engineering role have either bachelor's or advanced degrees in system engineering or a related field. So being a CAD jockey is a bit of a, a downgrade, I would say. <laughs> uh, so the same concept. It's one thing to know how to use the tool. It's another thing to be able to architect that tool or go above and beyond just doing the mouse clicks. So I think that's probably the distinction there. Yeah, and, and basically what you said is that the correct term is the mouthful of model-based systems engineer. Um, and a lot of people just say modeler because it's easier, but it might not be correct all the time. Um, yeah. So can, and we talked about this in the last episode a little bit where we gave an overview of what model-based systems en engineering is, but can you give a detailed description, anybody on the line, a detailed description of what um, a model-based systems engineer is and maybe some of the day-to-day -day or duties that person might have? So model-based system engineer, uh, model-based system engineering is the formalized application of modeling to support system requirements, design, analysis, verification, validation activities, beginning the conceptual design phase, continuing development of later life cycles, according to COSI. Very long mouthful, way too much <laughs> to say. Uh, Model-based system engineers do two things. They take they take the user need and they translate that into something for the vendor, or the the OEM, or whoever it is who is developing that system to to do. So you prescribe what it is you want, and then you verify it or you trace to it. You say, how can I show? How can I prove that that was actually done correctly and completely? And does that verify my stakeholder or validate my stakeholder need? So. Really, it's, it's two things. It's the ability to prescribe what you need and the ability to uh, prove that you have gotten there. And I think I think that may be a little bit of an acquisition-specific definition. Uh, on the OEM or the vendor side, it'd probably look a little bit different depending on exactly how they're, they're using model-based system engineering. But on the acquisition side, I think that's pretty accurate. Yeah. yeah, I think it's really important, too, to note that all of what Brett mentioned and said has to do with systems engineering, that the modeling aspects of it are the tool right. to help you do it better. Yep. Anything else to add on that description, Casey or Lindsay? Yeah, I think Rhett really hit it home with giving you the professional and Cozy's definition mm. and then summing it up as well um, in his own terms. But in a combination of Red and Jeff, they, they pretty much hit it right on the spot. Um, in summary, for myself, just straight out playing language, I like to kind of get back to the point that a model is just simply a shared representation of a system, right? So now all of us with model-based systems engineering can now see the same system represented in the same location. Um, and collectively, um, like Red said, we're, we're passing it off to vendors um, as a holistic picture. So. Right, and, the, and, the, and the, the difficult aspect of it is that we're, the, the model piece of it is learning a new language, being able to apply that language um, as the tool um, with a specific software. And that's, that's what you guys have, have been trained to learn, yep. and Lindsay's going through right now. So um, I, I think 
it's probably important right now to kind of maybe chat a little bit about what Sysmill is and what about Cameo and some of the software <laughs> applications that are out there. So Yeah, that's exactly where I was going, so that's a great segue. Um, okay. Can you tell me about Sysmill? And a follow-up question to that, is there any language um, that's similar that could prepare somebody that wanted to transition to be a model-based system engineer? Um, is 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 Python similar? Is any of uh, are any of those other languages similar to Sysmill that could help someone uh, uh, learn it faster? Go ahead, Lindsay. <laughs> but yeah, so I can take this one. So um, actually, when Jeff approached me about model-based systems engineering, he was trying to describe to me what it actually was. He said, "You're like modeling something," which what we talked about at the beginning was. I thought it was like a 3D thing, and they said it was like programming. I thought I was like typing in the command prompt, but it's actually um, not like that at all. It's more like um, it's a, it's a language, but it's a graphic language. It's a, like a two-dimensional graphic language. It's almost like when you're building these models, they're like, uh, they look like flow charts, but there's specific rules on, on how you read them. And so that's, what, that's where the language part comes in. Um, I don't know if that helps uh, viewers who have never heard about this before, but I had a lot of misconceptions about what it was before I started taking the class. And Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, Lindsay, as well. Um, I, I think there is generally a misconception of, you know, what is a model or a systems engineer or what is model-based systems engineering. I think um, in the big grand scheme of things, you know, we have UML and SysML to provide a standard amongst the systems engineering community. Uh, that way we all understand what someone is trying to convey within the model itself. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, yeah, it yeah. definitely does. Interfere. So I guess I was under the misconception also that it was a language similar to Python or um, C++ mm -hmm. or something like that. It sounds like it's a little bit different, um, but I assume that having that type of mindset, having a, a maybe a coding background or a coding mindset is um, very... Not necessarily. No? no. Okay. Yeah. There, there are a few things, too, I think I, I wanted to mention here is... Um, you know, when I first met Rhett, and, and we're getting into, you know, what each other knows about systems engineering and model-based systems engineering, you know, we talked about resources um, and the differences in our training. But one of the things that he mentioned up front, or one of the questions that I ha asked was, how did he get to the point where he knew all of the syntax and all of the fine, minute details within systems engineering or model-based systems engineering? And the reality is you have to refer back to the documentation. Um, and I think coding, uh, Python, for example, you know, it's the same way. You have to yep. refer back to the original documentation and actually, you know, get your hands on uh, what these things are actually actually meaning. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I, th I think that's a very accurate statement. I think diving deep into the spec is a good way to really get get your hands dirty and figure out exactly what you need to be, how to, how to notate stuff or uh, best notation for a given concept or something like that or how you should do different diagrams and so on yeah uh, are there any musicians here um <laughs> is anyone, i don't know if there are but uh, i i kind of equate it to like when you read a piece of music like sheet music like there's like all these specific rules that you have to follow to be able to interpret what you're seeing um but it's like a visual it's so it's almost like a visual code um yeah. except you know with this you've also got like the parametric links between all your different models Right. Yeah. I, I think that's actually a pretty good equivalency yeah. representation of sheet music. I would. That's, that's actually a good one. I haven't thought of that before. Uh, SysML was built off of UML. <coughs> UML was developed in the 90s uh, as a kind of a combination of a bunch of different modeling notations and, and modeling design. So DFD, IDF0, and so on. Uh, those types of notations. And then some of the different fields use slightly different, like sequence diagrams, activity diagrams, and so on. Uh, there were a lot of different things that were pulled together into the Unified Modeling Language, or UML. And then UML was later adapted uh, in, in the early, I think I want to say the early 2000s, but I'm, I might be off here, as an, a, a superset of UML. So it includes all the UML concepts, then adds a couple of things like parametrics and requirements specific to, uh, specific to systems engineering. And then a couple other minor changes, but they're not as important. So I think as far as similar notations go, uh, UML, people with software and UML experience will have a lot easier time coming up to speed. Uh, a lot of systems engineers will also have IDEF or 
Um, DOTAF view, well, DOTAF can also be represented in SystemL. Some of the, the similar modeling or originating equivalent modeling notations that were using the creation of UML and, and so on. Uh, SysML will also be, not to get too nerdy here, but <laughs> we'll eventually split off from UML in the next next version, uh, version 2.0, gotcha. coming out in the near future. Oh, cool. Um, so we talked a lot about SysML. What about, so I've heard Cameo a lot. Is that the software that you use or is that not? Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you want to explain what that is? Maybe um, just brief overview. So there's a several different modeling tools uh cameo or magic draw is one by made made by no magic recently acquired by Dassault. uh navair primarily uses that tool or cameo system modeler it's a software package on top of uh magic draw a couple of extensions and so on plugins okay. uh, there's also a couple of other ones like rational rhapsody uh, and then there really there's a lot of them there, i think there's like 30 something tools but some of the, the primary ones are Sparks EA, uh, Rational Rhapsody, and uh, Cameo Systems Modeler by, by Dassault No Magic. Then there's a couple of other ones like Inislate that uses LML, which is similar to SystemL lifecycle modeling language. Uh, but like I said, there's quite a few different options here, and primarily Navair uses Cameo Systems Modeler gotcha. through No Magic. So, how would somebody. Um learn how to use that software is there is there training outside of so obviously if you get a job at avian you, you're going to be trained to use that software but is there training that someone could take before getting hired as as a model-based system engineer i think uh what, what helped me out really was, was schooling in the very beginning and, and i should also say that uh it wasn't wasn't very hands-on in, in terms of the introduction into cameo um, we were actually given the option and the school provided an academic version or license for Cameo. But uh, we had um, pretty much an instructor walk us through the diagrams that Red just talked about, so the activity diagrams, uh, you know, internal block diagram, and, and the list goes on and on. But from what I've seen, generally, um, it, it helps out with just simply playing with the tools, getting familiarization. But... Um, I think I would struggle to say that there are some general classes out there that would kind of help you out. For me, I've had a couple of books and resources to kind of dive into that help me out. But the main thing I think is gaining uh, practical experience working with it. It's a lot like coding in the sense that um, you need to actually do it to get better at it. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is actually a great time for Lindsay to step in and talk about the experience that she's having right now. Um, you're going through a, a boot camp of sorts is that correct yeah yeah i'm doing um a course that um jeff recommended to me through avian um it's done through the it's taught by lenny delgatti is is um who does the online lectures and then pat maharg has been teaching us um like in in uh, what, um in classes like outside of that lecture um and it's it's been pretty good so far so good like um if anyone is like interested in learning it's like conceptually it's not it's not um, necessarily difficult to grasp, but as you go through the course, it's, I kind of think of it as like when you're learning algebra, like all the concepts kind of like um, start piling on top of each other and you need to know the previous concepts to understand the later ones. So um, you do need to thoroughly understand everything, but it's not too bad. Um, like I don't have like a super strong programming background. I don't even have a strong systems engineering background. I'm a mechanical engineer and I've been able to pick it up um, all right. It's maybe you, you do like three hours of lecture during the week and then you've got like an hour of um, like interactive in class with Pat and then reading your book and whatever other practice you're doing with the um, with the modeling software. Yeah, cool. So it, it mm -hmm. sounds like you're getting that practical experience that Casey was just talking about. So yes, um, very cool. Um, and like you said, and I think somebody said at some point, you're always going to have to refer back to that documentation. Um, mm -hmm. I, I code in JavaScript and HTML and all that doing front end stuff. And I'm on the JavaScript website more than I want to admit. But <laughs> um, 
Yeah. And I, I do want to jump back to, and I guess we didn't really talk about how like the path to becoming a model-based systems engineer, like what's the undergrad courses or major that, that a model-based systems engineer would take um, followed by uh, post-grad, what's the, the master courses. Um, and I think, right, you could probably talk to, about that. And then also um, experience. So you may have experience already in the DOD. What, what are some things, and we did talk about this a little bit in the last episode, but what are some of those um, areas where it, it would be easy to shift over to bottle based systems engineering? That's a great question, Ian. Uh, so I'd say it, it really depends on your your avenue in i think t e is a good way in i think uh pure systems engineering is a good way in i don't think there's a lot of pure systems engineers in the undergraduate level at any mm -hmm. rate uh aerospace mechanical sometimes on the, the more hardware side and they have to sometimes a bit of a struggle to shift over to a more of a logical or, or software mindset uh software engineers also are, are pretty good at that on occasion so i think i'd, I'd say those are some of the the primary paths in. And I think some people might be a little bit uh, curious as to why it's a T and E test and evaluation. It's because you're on you're on the the end side. You're you're looking through how these things are tested. and You're understanding that, hey, maybe those requirements weren't written very well when you're on the interpretation side. <laughs> <laughs> so you really get to understand the the troubles and the struggles that uh, that you're going to go through if you don't do a good job on the the prescriptive side. So I'd say those are some of the the couple paths in. Yeah. Uh, as far as both modeling it on a academic setting, uh, there's a couple different universities that are teaching it. Like Georgia Tech is the major one. I think most, I don't know most, but a lot of engineers come through uh, Georgia Tech, Stevens Institute of Technology. Uh, George Mason has a couple classes. I think there's a couple more as well that'll do that in the, the master's courses. As far as undergraduate, I'm not sure if there are any. Uh, there are some UML or other notation languages or graphical notation in play, but that's mostly master level. Right. And I think what I understood from the last podcast is that if you're an undergrad um, and you're pursuing some sort of technical degree, probably engineering is the best, the best route. Um, and then, like you said, at that master's level, deciding to maybe focus more on um, systems engineering and model-based systems engineering. Yeah. So I would like to say, I think it's, um, even if you don't necessarily have a background doing that, if you have like transferable skills, mm -hmm. um, I think I find it to be very useful. So like, um, you know, one of my previous, yeah, you know, I've, I've always been a mechanical engineer and a lot of my previous jobs, um, I had to create all of these, um, complex CAD models of all these systems that I had to build up. And, um, one of the problems you have with that is when you like change one part, you got to go back and change like a million other things. And one, and the great thing about models based system engineering is that you can actually keep track of all these interrelated things, um, with that, without having to have that mental checklist and it makes the process go, I think it would make the process go a lot faster and easier. Um, so even if you're not technically like a systems engineer person or studying that, if you are doing a job that would require, um, where it would actually make your job easier, I think that's also a good segue into learning this sort of thing because it would have helped me at my previous jobs, um, even as just a mechanical. Right. All right. I think that's a great point. There's a lot of transferable skills. I think there's a lot of uh, what some people consider soft skills that are important in model based system engineering. Mm -hmm. If you're that interface between the user need and the model, you have to be able to understand. You have to have those interpersonal skills and the ability to to really tease out that user need and, and prescribe that so i think that's another transferable skill uh, and to your point Lindsay, i think that's an excellent example of where there's a lot of different things coming together and if one thing changes it's going to break a lot of other things and having an awareness of that will make you a lot better as a model-based system engineer yes yeah, so jeff i think this is a great time to wrap it all back into avian um and talk about what we're doing to um help people get into model-based systems engineering so go ahead and and take it from there yeah well i think it's a pretty exciting time uh, for the company um, about a year and a half ago uh, i started to get a demand signal um, from navair here in Pax River, 
uh, as they were instituting and trying to institute the policies and the procedures and for model-based systems engineering into the into the systems engineering discipline here on base. And there just weren't any model-based systems engineers or a very small um, cadre of them in the area. Uh, so um, to to help that demand, uh, to, to go after that demand, um, the company uh, decided to make an investment in a lab with a partner company here in the area called Precise uh, to acquire uh, some Cameo licenses, their floating licenses in a virtual environment. This all happened kind of during COVID too, so we had to make it virtual. Um, and then develop a course uh, to, to kind of develop these, this skill set. So we latched on to the Delegati classes, but uh, that alone really doesn't give you the, the full practical application, enough to go into a program office to be able to do anything. So what we've done is we have uh, hired out um, a company called JHNA out of Huntsville, Alabama, and uh, through, a, through an individual who's got an enormous amount of experience and who teaches this um, to proctor um, students through the Delegati as well as uh, provide them with extra instruction. And then to be able to also uh, stick around after the course, after the certification, um, to support them as they uh, proceed into a, a specific program officer to do the actual work. So um, Avian is um, really invested in this and, and we want to help support not only our customers, but certainly the skill set in the area. And then there's applications outside of nav air into other systems commands within the Navy. Other services are, are starting to, to build it up. And so we see a, see a real growth in this area. So uh, this is the first class and Lindsay's one of the first students to go through. We have three others and uh, we're looking to start uh, again in the summertime uh, with another group uh, to go through. So, um, so exciting times and uh, looking, looking forward to, uh, to growing in this particular area. Yeah, so it sounds like we as a company are on the forefront of something that is going to be big in the future, uh, which is always nice to hear. Um, and we are taking the right steps to make sure that we are supporting our customers and we're doing it better, smarter, and, and more efficiently. Um, so with that, is there any last minute, oh, by the ways, any other points that you guys wanted to make on this episode? I I'd just add there's a couple of certifications you can get. There's the OCSMP certification, uh, or a couple of them, and then also uh, SEP, System Engineering Professional certifications. So I think those are a good, good way to prove your knowledge. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, definitely. And um, is there an online resource? I know in Cozy has a lot of information, but is there any other online resources? Um, that might list like some of those certifications or some of the uh, courses around the country or anything like that? And COSI and the object management group are probably our best starting points. Gotcha, cool. All right, well with that, I wanna say thank you guys for joining me today. And on the next episode, we're actually talking about real world MBSE applications. So we've defined what MBSE is, we've looked at what it takes to get educated, um, start a path towards becoming an expert. And then on the next episode, we're looking at the applications of MBSE in the real world. So with that, I wanna say again, thank you guys for joining me and I'll see everybody next time. The Model Vision Podcast is brought to you by Avian. At Avian, we provide extraordinary support in the areas of model-based systems engineering. We help our customers detect problems early using modeling with a purpose. With Avian's MBSE network, we provide a collaborative ecosystem to access, define, and implement a tailored MBSE approach for program success. Avian's model-based systems engineers work with SysMill using Cameo software to replace the document-centric nature of typical systems engineering.
our engineers expose vulnerabilities within your system before implementation. Ensure speed to the fleet with a solution that brings clarity early, enhances the chief engineer's capabilities, creates a holistic view, allowing for better decision-making, and simplifies complexity. Everything works together to bring certainty to your design. If you're interested in learning more about Avian's capabilities within MBSC, you can visit avian.com capabilities.